to week seven. This week we are covering autonomics. So thanks again for joining us. Um, if you've been following along week to week, thanks for watching all of them. If you haven't, feel free, you can jump in at any week, but at, um, if you have time, go back and watch our previous videos so that you can have an understanding of everything we've covered this quarter and really get insight into the bigger picture that we're trying to build for you guys this quarter. So just some quick announcements. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you don't already. A lot of you guys did already. So thank you to all, I think like 42 of you guys now. And um, if you don't already follow us on Instagram, our Instagram is at lifeu underscore FNC. And that's a great place to find us um, just for some weekly content as well as we post our weekly videos updated there. Um, so it's also easy to find. So the next coming weeks, this week we're doing autonomics. And just to give you um, guys a better picture of what we're going to be covering the next few weeks, we weren't positive at the beginning of the quarter, but we've definitely made our decisions by now. So next week, Rofe is going to be covering primitive and pathological reflexes, as well as muscle spindles, adjusting, and a lot of great stuff. So be sure to tune into that. And then the week after, so week nine, we're going to be covering um, just a little bit of our, we're gonna be bringing everything together for the quarter. So that'll actually be our last week. And we're gonna be going over our neuro exam and some case studies and really helping you guys to put everything together. So that'll also be a really important week. So these last three are gonna be heavy hitting and good information. So don't get tired of us yet and keep watching. Um, oh, and then, okay, an email update. So as you guys know, you guys get a weekly email from us um, if you are on our email list that sends out just our weekly club information and um, a link to the video. So that's what we've been doing this quarter, but just in general, we've always been sending those out um, through that email. And so I think it's like info at lifeneurologyclub.com or something like that. But I want to be really transparent with you guys that we no longer have access to the website that that email is linked to. So we're able to send messages um, through, our, um, through our website that allows us to send through our mailing list, but we don't have access to receive your emails if you're sending them to that uh, email. So I've been posting underneath all of our YouTube videos this quarter, and we've updated it everywhere that this is our email now. It's going to be lifeufnc at gmail.com. So if you guys ever want to get in contact with us, you have to email us questions or just anything um, if you want to reach us, this is a great place to do it. But um, so be sure to email this email, not just reply to the email that um, you guys are receiving our weekly club let um, letters from. So this is it, lifeufnc at gmail.com if you guys want to um, contact us at all. So our goals for tonight, we're going to review what we know so far from our neuro exam. We've covered a lot in the past couple of weeks. We're gonna go over just autonomic nervous system in general. We're gonna add it into our loop and keep building on it like we have every week. We're gonna go over the four functions of the PMRF and talk about the PMRF um, and the IML and sympathetics all a little bit individually and how important they are for our patients. And then we're going to talk about how to maybe tone down the sympathetic nervous system. Rope is gonna talk about how to test the PMRF and then he's going to explain dysautonomia and some common cases of um, conditions of dysautonomia. And then at the end, we're going to go over case studies to help you guys learn how to apply the information that we're giving you and how a patient might present if they have a dysfunctional autonomic nervous system. Alrighty, so let's do a quick review. If you feel good about it, you can fast forward this, but I think it would be good to just get a refresher for all of us. So, the frontal lobe, we learned our finger tap. We learned dual tasking, which is adding on any of our neuro tests, adding in that cognitive aspect where they're having to think harder, such as saying the months of the year backwards, having them play like one of those brain games where they have to, let's say you wanna have them name fruits and then the last letter of the fruit that they say is what the next fruit they have to say comes up with or something like that but anything that's going to be more taxing to their brain and make them think 
and then gait. We also know that our frontal lobe is um, just controlling all of our voluntary movement, but um, when we add in dual tasking with gait and compare them, it helps us to get insight into the frontal lobe. Parietal lobe, we learned graphesthesia, point localization, so testing their body map, as well as blind spot mapping. And blind spot mapping also is with our temporal lobe. So when we're doing blind spot mapping, the top portion of our blind spot, we want to think of as temporal, and then the bottom portion of our blind spot would be parietal. And then um, temporal, we all have our finger rub test for the cochlear portion, our hearing. Um, and then blind, or we talked about blind spot, and then sound localization. So just like we have a somatosensory map, we have a sound map. So that's when you snap and have the patient with their eyes closed try to point to where you're snapping. Um, occipital lobe, that's our visual cortex. So we talked about confrontation, so coming in different areas around the patient's visual field and having them tell you if the object is moving or not moving and as soon as they can see it. Um, Cerebellum, we did rapid alternating movements. You can do them at different levels, testing different um, nuclei of the cerebellum. And um, we're looking for dystidokinesia. And then we did the finger to nose and the heel to shin, which are all testing for um, possible dysmetria. We have our balance tests and Rombergs, which we use Rombergs functionally. Um, in school, they will teach you that it's for the dorsal columns, but when we're looking for Romberg, we're looking at that balance, sway, um, and things like that. And then we also learned our eye movements for the cerebellum in those different diagonals. So remember, you look up to your cerebellum. So this right diagonal is going to be um, the right cerebellum, and the left diagonal is the, um, or is the left cerebellum. Okay. Um, and then our ocular motor function. So we talked about all of our different eye movements. Specifically in this order, we have pursuit, saccades, OPK, VOR, COR, and vergence. So divergence and convergence. Um, and we talked about all the different ways you can test those and the areas that they're affecting. We talked about the midbrain. So with our red nucleus, um, you want to look at arm, string, arm swing. Um, we talked about the pupillary light reflex, both direct and indirect and the different functions that are the different ways that they can um, show you dysfunction. And then we talked about just our eye examination because we know cranial nerves three and four live in our midbrain. And so our eye movements are um, very tied to our midbrain. Our vestibular system, we did balance, sway testing. We did facudas, which is the step test and you turn towards the side of lesion. We did our VOR, which is our vestibulo-ocular reflex, which is when your eyes and your head move equally and opposite. And so we did um, VOR with different eye positions matching with the canal positions um, from our semicircular canals that we learned in our vestibular system. And then we also learned how Maggi. So the VOR, the way we learned to test it in school is just this slow movement, looking for the eyes to go opposite to the head and then how Maggie's was those quick changes. We went over cranial nerves last week. So remember, we have one and two in our, um, more of our cortex area. We have then in our brain stem, which is the main um, testing that we'll do with the cranial nerve. Cranial nerves is looking into the functions of our brain stem. We have three and four in the midbrain, and then we have four, so four more, five through, eight in our pons, and then nine through 12 in our medulla. And so now we're adding onto this test and we're getting to autonomics. So the very first week of club, way back when, we talked about neuron theory and the three things that a neuron needs to survive. It needs oxygen, fuel or glucose, and appropriate stimulation. So remember these three things as we start to talk about autonomics. So the autonomic nervous system, overall we can think of it as our fuel delivery system. Its primary function is going to be del to deliver fuel and waste to and from um, different cells throughout our body. And so it's most commonly divided into our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. We like to think in chiropractic schools, our sympathetic is lying within that 
um, thoracolumbar region, and then our parasympathetic divisions in our craniosacral regions of the spine. It controls the diameter of our blood vessels. It controls venous return to the heart. It's responsible for shunting blood appropriately to responding to particular movements. So say if you're going from lying down supine all the way to standing, your body needs to be able to accommodate for gravity and shunt blood to your head quickly. Um, it's also responsible for controlling our respiration and oxygen delivery to organs and tissues. So remember those three things I just talked about, fuel, oxygen, and appropriate stimulation. The autonomic nervous system is responsible for two of the three things that a neuron needs to survive. So when we're trying to um, work on the, the nervous system health of our patients, you can start to see how important our autonomic function and the regulation of our autonomics in our patients becomes critical in um, treating them. So um, when we're looking at a patient, we want to first look at their autonomics. First, to rule out just any emergencies or pathologies that they might have, which may indicate that they need more critical care. Um, that would just be the first step. And then as well, you want to monitor it before, during, and after their treatment. So you want to constantly be monitoring it. So our autonomics can tell us just about the overall function of our patient, how they're doing that day. Um, what, and just having measuring them regularly can help you gain a baseline understanding of that patient's autonomic function. But then as well as when you're going through your different treatments with that patient, you can monitor their autonomics to see if that treatment is, um, is appropriate for that patient and to help you gauge the level of treatment that you should go to the intensity level. So let's say that we're doing gait stabilization with a patient and I'm just turning their head back and forth, having them look at a dot in front of them. And so as I'm doing this, maybe I have a pulse ox on them. So I'm watching their heart rate. I'm just subconsciously looking at their breathing. I'm just looking out of my periphery to monitor their breathing levels. And as I'm turning their head, I start to feel that their skin gets cold or maybe clammy or things like that. Then you want to know, you want to just stop that therapy. As soon as you start to see any signs of the autonomics crashing, you really want to stop the therapy um, and give the patient either a break for a couple minutes, whatever, to regain themselves, or just maybe call it, um, call it a day on that treatment session. So it can be really important, and um, just even in student clinic or any clinic opportunity you have in the program, when you're looking at your patients, it's nice um, opportunity to just have a pre and post check to just have something like a pulse ox on your patient to see the effect on their your nervous system or on the patient's nervous system that your treatment had for them. So this is our lovely loop that we go back to every week. So last week we talked about the mesencephalon and the PMRF. We were really talking about them not ne not necessarily as the PMRF as a functional unit. We were talking about it more as just the regions of the brainstem, so the pons and the medulla for where anatomically our cranial nerves lie. But this week, we're truly going to talk about the PMRF as, um, as a unit. So it, remember, it stands for pontomedullary reticular formation. So pontomedullary, just referring to where in the brainstem, that mid to lower brainstem that um, this region is and then reticular formation. So reticular is like that net-like webbing structure of the intertwining of all of the different nuclei within these regions of the brainstem and formation, so just structure. And then today we're adding in a new character called the IML. It's gonna be the final piece. You guys have actually learned all of the different shapes on this chart now, so congratulations. But um, today we're going to be adding in the IML, which stands for Intero Medial Lateral Column. And so um, we can see the connection between these two. Instead of mo the majority, which so far we've been over, have been green for stimulating and exciting, the PMRF is actually going to inhibit the IML. So it's an inhibitory relationship. So last week we went over how our right vestibular system, right cerebellum, and most strongly our right cortex 
are going to go in and innervate our right PMRF. So think of those as ipsilateral innervation down to the PMRF. And then our PMRF, we learned, is going to go down and affect our right body. So my right PMRF is going to ipsilaterally affect my body. But if you start to think about it, um, the way we originally learned this loop, so I want to keep you guys on track with the loop, is we learned it going right body to right cerebellum to mesencephalon, so contralateral mesencephalon, that's where we're getting that cross. So right body, right cerebellum, left mesencephalon, left cortex, and now down from that left cortex, we're going to go down into the ipsilateral to the cortex, the PMRF. So from our left cortex, we're going down to the left PMRF to then inhibit our left IML. So we still have that cross pattern. So when I'm seeing um, contralaterally and ipsilaterally, it's referring usually to the connection that came prior to it. So when I say the right cortex and it activates ipsilaterally the PMRF, it's going to be actually that stimulation for my left body going into my left cerebellum, into my right mesencephalon, right cortex, right PMRF. That's that um, overall pathway that we, or the loop that we want you guys to understand. And um, we also have our right mesencephalon going into our left IML. And we have it that way in this chart, but it's actually going bilaterally. So the reason that it is, we think, in this chart, we didn't make it. It's been in club for a long time, um, longer than either Ropai or I. So um, our understanding of it is that because we will learn that our cortex so strongly fires into our PMRF, and our PMRF is going to inhibit this um, ipsilateral IML, that the most strong connection in our functional pathway is going to be that right mesencephalon over contralaterally to that left IML, and then the left mesencephalon over to the right IML. So just if that gets confusing, um, you guys might have a better understanding. So now we're going to talk about this rule that we have called the 90-10 rule, which it's really going to help us explain. We know our autonomics are important for our patients, but just how important looking into their, the modulation of their autonomics that, um, and what it can tell us about their overall brain health. So our, we know that 90% of our brain's output stays ipsilaterally for reflexive control. We've been talking a lot the past couple of weeks about this 10% of the brain output that goes to contralateral movement. So that classic loop that we've been talking about is about how my left cortex is going to allow me to move my right arm voluntarily um, like this. But 90% of that brain output stays ipsilaterally in that connection that I was just explaining where the left cortex is going down to the left PMRF. So of this 90%, then 90% of the 90% goes to that PMRF, and then the rest, the 10% that's left over of that 90% goes bilaterally from the cortex to the midbrain. Um, and so then, so we can just think about how strongly, so if 90% of that 90% is going into the PMRF, that's more than 80% of our overall brain output going into this autonomic function and um, our regulation. So when we're looking at our patients, um, just their overall neuro exam, don't forget this part because we think of, especially I think just in, in general, when we're going through our physical exam, vitals seem to be something that's so given. And when we take blood pressure and heart rate and respiration rate, it's not that we don't think about it, but we just do it at the beginning and then we're focused on our orthopedic exams or things like that. It doesn't seem as exciting maybe. But when we want to think about our patient's nervous system function and how much brain output is actually going into regulating that part of our exam, it becomes extremely important into understanding our patient's nervous system health. So, oh, okay. So. We're going to talk about the PMRF, and it has four functions. 
never actually um, brought it out this way, so I didn't know it was going to be one at a time. But that's okay, it's cool. Um, so we're going to start with the first rule. And if you guys want to take notes, this is probably like the most important thing to write down from tonight. There's a lot of important things, but definitely make sure you write down and understand these four rules, that four functions of the PMRF, so that you can understand what 80% of the brain output is actually trying to do. So when it's um, working well, our PMRF, we're going to start with, it is inhibiting primary afferent primary afferents, so which are in our dorsal horn. So our dorsal horn is where the majority um, is like a major site for termination of our primary afferents. And it's also the dorsal horn is also very important in regulating and um, sending information from our nociceptive primary afferents up into our brain. So telling our brain about painful stimuli. So if you want to um, break this down into just a simple thing, you can think that the PMRF's first job is to inhibit pain. And remember, our PMRF is going to affect the ipsilateral side of the body. So my right PMRF is going to be responsible for inhibiting pain on the right side of my body. So then we have the inhibition of Renshaw cells in the ventral horn is the second job. So the Renshaw cells are these inhibitory interneurons that we have in the gray matter of our spinal cord, specifically in the ventral horn. So the normal job of the Renshaw cells is to inhibit alpha motor neurons. But since we're the PMRF overall, all of these four rules, so you guys know, is going to be inhibitory. But since we're inhibiting an inhibitory interneuron, the Renshaw cells, a double negative equals a positive. So inhibition of inhibition equals excitation. So we're actually, if we're inhibiting the Renshaw cells, we're going to inhibit the inhibition of the alpha motor neurons and excite them. So this job of the PMRF helps us to regulate and maintain overall global muscle tone in our body. And again, it's going to be something that we're going to look at ipsilaterally. So my left PMRF will regulate and maintain global muscle tone over my left side of my body. And the third rule is going to be inhibition of the anterior muscles above T6 and the posterior muscles below T6. So I think the easiest way to think about this inhibition is think about what these muscles do. If we weren't inhibiting these muscles, we would look like this. We would have external rotation, forward rolled shoulders, and think of more of that animalistic or like monkey, gor gorilla, whatever you want to think of, um, more of that quadruped type posture. And so by inhibiting these muscles above and below T6, we're going to be able to have that extension bipedalism posture that we have as humans. Um, and so primarily, it's not all flexor muscles, but primarily these muscles that is, are being inhibited is our flexor tone. So we're inhibiting flexor tone. So then the last one, let's see, okay. So we have our PMRF inhibits our IML output. Remember we talked about IML is our in, interomedial lateral um, column and it's on the ipsilateral side. It's in our lateral horn of our spinal column. We're going to talk about it a little bit more in depth in the next couple of slides, but it the major function of the IML is modulating our overall sympathetic um, nervous system output throughout our body. So by inhibiting the IML, we're going to have decreased sympathetic output. So sometimes you might hear us refer to our PMRF as um, responsible for parasympathetics, or we know that our vagus nerve and um, a lot of parasympathetic activity it, um, relies in this area of the brainstem, but also because of its function of inhibiting IMLs, which is responsible for sympathetics, that's why we might say that is PMRF is more parasympathetic and IML is more shorthandedly sympathetic. But realize it's not necessarily that simple. Um, 
So what would maybe be signs of decreased function? So we're gonna go more in detail with this a little bit later when we talk about testing the PMRF, but just really quickly, let's go over. So if we're not, if we don't have our first rule, we're not inhibiting primary afferents, maybe we're going to get pain on one side of our body. Um, if we're not inhibiting our Renshaw cells, so we don't have very good global tone, maybe we are um, just constantly spraining our ankle on one side of our body. And so when you talk about straining an ankle, it can be multifactorial. Don't automatically assume it's PMRF. We need to go through our levels of elision and we need to think about um, everything else in our neuro exam. It could be Sarah Beller that maybe they don't have good coordination or they have dysmetry and don't know where the ground is. It could be maybe they don't know where their ankle is in space. It's a problem with their somatotopic map of their ankle and um, they don't have good regulation of it because they don't have good awareness of it. Or it could be that they don't have very good tone in the area. So, I mean, it could be all of those things combined, but when, you're, um, when we say one thing, um, such as an example for one thing, um, it doesn't mean that nothing else could cause it. We're just giving you an example, just so you guys know. Um, and inhibition of anterior muscles above T6 and inhibiting this flexor tone, you can think of this posture that we all have when we're sitting on our computers at home right now and we just get slouched over and all curled up into a ball. It's that going to be that tone. And then if we're not inhibiting our sympathetics, we can just think of something as simple as having higher blood pressure on one side versus the other. So a little bit more about our IML. So our IML is a homologous column of cell bodies and it starts all the way in our mesencephalon. So um, when we talk about the IML, think of it starting all the way up there. Sometimes we as chiropractors I think like to think about um, really focus in on our thoracic IML, which is our thoracolumbar region. But no, remember that the IML is starting in the mesencephalon. So mesencephalon, then it goes to PMRF, thoracic lateral horns, and goes all the way to terminate at the um, sacral spinal cord. So they, one of the biggest portions is this thoracic IML or the lateral horn cells between the divisions of T1 to L2 in the gray matter. So it's that green portion over there, so the lateral horn is just on the sides of the gray matter in our spinal cord. And so this thoracic IML is the origin for our sympathetic preganglionic neurons. These neurons then send axons through the ventral root, which then are going to synapse on a ganglion. These ganglionic neurons then are going to send postsynaptic sympathetic messages to a target cell, such as our heart, to say, hey, speed up, buddy, we gotta go. Um, and then these ganglion are in a chain-like formation that lies next to our spinal cord, so in what we call is the paravertebral ganglionic chain. So when we are adjusting as chiropractors, we, um, you can definitely see this when you're adjusting the thoracics and you have um, a pulse ox on, it can tend to increase the patient's heart rate, but um, we're gonna think about this a little bit broader and we're gonna think more in depth than just adjusting th um, thoracics means increasing sy sympathetics. We're gonna go through this so you guys can have a better understanding when you're adjusting your patients, how this is actually going to be modulating their autonomics. So the main function of the IML, if you get nothing else, remember nothing else, is that is going to be mediating the sympathetic innervation of our entire body. So now that we've talked about what modulates the sympathetic nervous system, let's remind ourselves what the actual functions of it are. It will dilate our pupils. So the way I like to remember these, just so I'm not constantly memorizing, trying to remember, okay, does it dilate, does it constrict back and forth, is think about it in a circumstance is if you're running from a tiger or a bear. We always like to think about the sympathetic nervous system as that fight or flight response, classically. So if you think about that and what you would, your body would need to survive in that situation, it can help you to just understand what the body, sympathetic nervous system's actual functions are for and not just memorizing one or the other. So dilating our pupils so that if we were running from a tiger or bear at night, 
that we're getting as much light into our eye as possible so that we can see and be um, clear. It's going to increase our heart rate and our blood pressure. We're getting vasoconstriction of our larger arteries, but vasodilation of our capillaries and arterioles so that we can get nutrients as our metabolism is increased. And so we're gonna need more nutrients to supply our running and things like that. And then we're gonna get increased sweating to cool our body down, bronchial dilation, get more air to our lungs. We're gonna decrease gastric motility because we don't really need to be digesting our food or thinking about that if we're trying to survive and we're in that fight or flight mode. And then we're also going to get stimulation of the adrenal medulla and cortex. So we know that these glands are responsible for secreting our catecholamines. So if we think about this and we um, think about what a patient might look like if they have a chronic um, stimulation of their sympathetic nervous system, we can actually relate it to why a patient might have low back pain. And um, it's an important concept to understand in helping us do our differential diagnosis of what could be causing that low back pain. So let's think about our um, stimulation our, of our, med medula, our adrenal medulla and cortex. So when we have these uh, catecholamines released, if we have them chronically released and we have that increase in blood flow, it's going to, um, affect, our, it's going to affect our pain fibers. So our C fibers. And what happens is these C fibers start to become depolarized more easily because the catecholamines response is going to, our catecholamines in our blood are going to open up our sodium channels in, this, um, in the cell. And so it's allowing sodium to rush into the cell and depolarize these fibers more easily. And then over time, the patient is going to become more acutely aware of any pain stimulation to their body and it's going to become um, because they're more acutely aware it can feel more severe and so then if the patient is just very extremely aware it can start to um, they can start to experience pain in areas where there's not a correlating um, tissue damage to explain the pain that they're feeling and sensing and so that's called allodynia when they have that experience but overall where a patient might find themselves having these pains tend to be areas in the brain that have less somatosensory mapping to them so remember back when we talked about the parietal lobe we had that homunculus drawing over our um over our cortex and so we were showing that our tongue and our hands and things like that have very detailed and higher areas of the brain dedicated to their somatic somatosensory mapping so that we can um, have very high awareness of where they are in the brain and anything that they're censoring. But areas like our trunk and our low back don't have as much somatosensory mapping and so it's most common for these areas when you start to get dysfunction in your um, in your pain on your pain sensation and things like that it can start to affect these areas first. So if you have a patient that comes in and they have low back pain or they're just very sensitive, when you do the pinwheel, they jump like crazy and you just aren't sure what's going on because you can't necessarily find a correlating injury or something that could explain the pain they're having, it might be important to go then look further into their autonomics to see if they have a dysregulation that could help to explain maybe some of the sensations that they're having. And like I said, any of these examples, they're possible causes. So it's not an end-all be-all. If your patient comes in with low back pain, it doesn't necessarily mean that they've had chronic stress and it's causing allodynia and they're getting low back pain. Like, don't think that way. It's just we want to be thinking in differentials and thinking of possible causes so then we can see when we do our exam, what is the story for this particular patient in front of us. So let's talk about sympathetic embryology because this is actually going to be very important for us to understand as chiropractors. So we have our neural crest cells, which then divided into our medial and lateral crest cells. And then the lateral crest cells further divided into our sympathetic ganglia and our sensory ganglia, our dorsal root ganglia. And so because 
embryologically, these two areas were um, developed together. They divided from the same cells. Then any time you stimulate your sensory ganglia, so any sensory input into the brain is also going to activate our IML. It's going to affect it. And so if you can remember this, um, it's not necessarily we don't get dramatic increases in our sympathetics from smaller sensory inputs because um, our, that input is only going to be represented by like 10% of our brain. But it, it, it does become very important if you have a patient who has a lesion in their um, PMRF and so they're not inhibiting that IML and let's say they already have crazy increased sympathetics. Maybe when you give them an adjustment, if let's say they have a lesion on the right side of their PMRF. And so if you're going to give them an adjustment and it is going to further stimulate that, it's further going to stimulate, let's say that you give them an adjustment on the right side because that's where their pain is. They're not inhibiting pain on this side of the body and they're, incre they're having increased sympathetic sensations on the right side of the body. So you adjust them on the right. You're then going to be going through the pathway and you're going to be going adjust on the right side of the body. So right cerebellum, left mesencephalon, left cortex down to left PMRF, down to left body. If that PMRF is functioning, it's going to further inhibit the sympathetics on their left side and, um, and you're going to have a further imbalance instead of helping to regulate and balance out the sensation that they're having. So it becomes very important in um, looking at our patient's neurological exam to understand the function and stabilization of their, um, the integrity of their autonomic system so that we're making sure if we have the choice between maybe doing less adjustments and picking a particular side versus adjusting every single subluxation that we find, if we can avoid um, doing anything that would further, um, further aggravate or increase their sympathetics or do something that isn't as optimal for them, then we can avoid it and know that because we've done our exam for that patient. So we want to remember that any sensory input that we're giving is going to be affecting the IML. So this is a fun slide and um, we talk about wind up a lot, I feel like, in functional neurology and we don't always explain what it is or talk about it too much. So I just wanted to bring up the vocabulary for you guys in case we've mentioned it and you didn't know what we were saying. So. It's titled, Work From Home, Scrolling and Wind Up. So I'm gonna explain how maybe work from home and this scrolling habit that we have, this culture, might be contributing to further wind up um, in our mesencephalon and IML. So wind up um, is a result of negative plasticity. So this, this can happen when the brain has, an area of the brain has been lesioned or dysfunctional for quite a while and then the IML in the mesencephalon have still been stimulated or maybe even stimulated too much. Or um, more consequentially, the brain can might have tra gone through transneural degeneration, and so it, it isn't able to regulate the IML because it's not able to send stimulation to that PMRF, which would then inhibit that IML. So you're not getting that regulation uh, appropriately. And so if you start to get this, if you don't have that inhibition of the IML or these areas are stimulated too much, they start to become extremely efficient and they're activated more easily and they just work really, really well. And so you start to get people in this chronic wind up, chronic sympathetic state. And so I just wanted to bring the idea of how we might be contributing to this wind up further with our just everyday habits that we don't even think about. So maybe you already have increased sympathetics. You've been working from home all day, typing on your computer, and you're just stressed out. You've been getting school emails and notifications. You had a test, whatever it is. And then on top of that, what we do to relax is we'll pull out our phone and or laptop or something and we'll be start scrolling. So we'll start doing an OPK if you think about it. We're looking up, snapping down, looking up, snapping down. 
we're doing uh, these vertical eye movements, which we talk about being more specifically associated with our mesencephalon because of the cranial nerve activation that um, is happening. And so when we're scrolling on Instagram or Facebook or through emails or whatever it is we're doing, and we say we're doing that to relax, and on top of that, we know adding in any extra stimulation to our body is actually going to be um, activating our IML, it's going to be affecting it, then we can really think about how incidentally and not even meaning to, we can start to further contribute to our wind up um, just through our daily habits. So my advice would be to just at least set an hour for uh, or set a timer for at least every hour and then get up, take a break, stretch, inhibit those flexors a little bit and stretch them out. Breathe, take some deep breaths, close your eyes, don't look at anything, take a break, um, go for a walk outside, anything like that to help um, reset your body a little bit and truly give, your, um, give yourself a break from that IML and um, mesencephalic activation. So this is the question, isn't it? How do we tone down the sympathetic nervous system? So, I mean, overall, I think that in our culture, our society lately, we, we tend to just really harp on our sympathetic nervous system and cortisol activation and just we think of it as such this negative thing and it's a bad thing, it's horrible. If you have cortisol levels that are high, like that's it. And I want you guys to remember, take back into context, the importance of our sympathetic nervous system. Think about how important it is just for our vital function. If we didn't have it, it would be so dangerous for us. So just remember that everything is a spectrum and it's a balance. So we want to have sympathetics for the protection and um, just survival mechanism that it provides us. And it is important in having, it's, it's how we wake up in the morning. But um, so don't always think, don't always give it this negative connotation because having the sympathetic state actually allows us to do different things um, than we, that we wouldn't be able to without it. But when it is out of well and balance, let's say it's wound up and it's really high, um, what do we do for it? So a lot of people like to say that to inhibit the sympathetics, you want to just do a lot of parasympathetic, parasympathetic activity. So that's partially true, but it's just oversimplified. So I want to take you guys through the big picture. So the main way that we would regulate our sympathetic nervous system is by looking at the level of the sympathetic nervous system determined by our cortical function. So our cortex, remember, is sending 90% of that out of its um, of the 90% of just automatic functions are going down to that PMRF. So it's regulating that PMRF, which then when it's functioning correctly, should be inhibiting that IML, regulating it. And our IML is that modulatory system that modulates our sympathetic system. So we have to go through that chain and make sure that all of the parts of those chains are working correctly so that we can get to that end goal of regulating our sympathetic nervous system. When the sympathetic ner nervous system is appropriately inhibited, by our PMRF, the parasympathetic system is inversely responsive. So if we have a high sympathetic state, we have a low parasympathetic state and vice versa. So it's really just important that we learn how to regulate our sympathetic nervous system and go about it that way too, then inversely, we're going to also be regulating our parasympathetic nervous system function. So the key takeaway is that the level of the sympathetics is based solely upon the ability of the brain to attenuate it appropriately. So unless our brain is able to regulate the system that regulates our sympathetics, we're not going to have proper autonomic and sympathetic function. So just remember that. And then also on the last slide I forgot to mention, but so what happens if you have wind up? How do you fix it? So it's the same thing. We want to be regulating our sympathetic nervous system, regulating the functions of our cortex, our PMRF, which will in our, our IML um, inversely. 
and thinking of all of those things. It might be a little bit more difficult, especially if you've had wind up for a long time and those areas are very efficient and, um, and they've plasticized that way, but we're still gonna work the same way to just um, regulate them and, um, and get everything working appropriately. And so now we're gonna give it over to Roque to teach us how to test the PMRF. All right, so now we're going to show you how to test for the function of the PMRF and what you might see if somebody has a dysfunction in the PMRF, okay? So we have these four major things here. We have increased sensation, hypotonia, pyramidal paresis, and increased sympathetics. Now these four things go along with the uh, four functions of the PMRF, and I'm going to start breaking these down one by one so they make a lot more sense to you. So increased sensation, so our first function of the PMRF was to inhibit all the primary afferents. Now, if you have a dysfunction in the, in the area of, of the lower brainstem and you're not able to inhibit those primary afferents, you are gonna increase the sensation from one side of the body versus the other. So when you perform pinwheel vibration and light touch testing, you might see that the patient uh, is uh, presenting to you with more sensation on one side of the body versus the other. Now with pain, Remember that we also, the PMRF inhibits pain. So it has descending pain inhibitory pathways. And if you have a dysfunction in that area, you're not gonna be able to inhibit that pain on that one side of the body. And let me give you an example. So let's say a patient comes into your office with, a, with left chronic shoulder pain, okay? And they tell you that they've been to all these different manual therapists. They've been to PETs, they've been to massage therapists. They've been to all these chiropractors, they've been to a medical doctor, okay? And none of them really worked on the shoulder that well, okay? The pain is still there. So you might wanna start thinking about a neurological basis for this pain. So one thing that's common for all those other manual therapists is that they probably only treated the side of the pain, okay? So they're probably doing soft tissue maneuvers, they're probably doing all sorts of things for this left shoulder to decrease the pain. And there's nothing wrong with that but you might have to consider a different strategy if a patient presents to you with, with a complaint like this. So the neurology behind it from the PMRF function is that when all those therapists were activating the left shoulder or whatever they were doing to the left sh shoulder would result in activity of the right cortex. And the right cortex, as you know, fires down to the right PMRF to inhibit pain on the right side of the body, okay? So he, that this particular patient didn't need to inhibit pain on this right side of the body, they needed that cortical activity here on the left, okay? So what if you were to activate the right side of the body? You would do um, maneuvers or adjustments to the right shoulder or adjust them on the right side of their body to increase left cortical activity to then further uh, fire down the PMRF and have descending pain inhibition to that left shoulder, okay? So once again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do all the treatments to the left. I think you absolutely should, but there might be a neural mechanism that you have to take into consideration, such as a PMRF dysfunction. And if somebody has a PMRF dysfunction, you might see these other findings too, okay? So it's really, it depends on your patient. All right, so next, hypotonia. Hypotonia meaning we have less muscle tone, meaning we have less alpha motor and gamma motor neuron activity, okay? And the reason why we have this is because the second function of the PMRF was to inhibit these Renshaw cells. And these Renshaw cells are these inhibitory interneurons in the spinal cord. And if you no longer inhibit the inhibition, you get inhibition, okay? And thus hypotonia. And with hypotonia, you present with decreased myotactic stretch reflexes, palatal, par palatal paresis, and you wanna palpate for tone for the pyramidal paresis distribution area, okay? so. Uh, let's start with the palpating the tone, okay? So the third function of the PMRF was to inhibit all the flexors. So the muscles uh, anterior and above T6 and the muscles below T6 posteriorly, okay? When you lose that inhibition, you get bias towards more ac activation of, uh, of these flexors on the upper extremity and the flexors on the, on the lower extremity. And what you see, you might see this internal rotation and a little bit more flexion like this. You might see an elevated shoulder as well. And then you might see an externally rotated hip like that. And what this does is that when you lose the inhibition, 
and you have more activity to these flexures, meaning that reflexogenically, you're more hypotonic on the extensor side in the upper extremity. And in the lower extremity, you will be more hypotonic in the anterior compartment. Okay, so it follows this pyramidal distribution. Okay, so you want to palpate from one side to the other and also flexors versus extensors. And we're going to talk about this flexor versus extensor, hypertonic versus hypotonic tone of the muscles uh, and ligaments and etc. Next week, when we're going to talk, when we're going to introduce you to uh, fast stretch adjusting, etc. Okay, but right now, this is what we're looking for the PMRF function. So then, also with the dysfunction of the PMRF, you might see. Uh, palatal paresis, meaning that when you look into, look at the patient's soft palate, you have them open their, open their mouth and say, ah, and you shine a light in there and you look in how the soft palates elevate, okay? On the side of PMRF dysfunction, you might see this, okay? The right side doesn't elevate. Let's say I have a right side issue on the PMRF. The right side might not elevate appropriately. And then also what you want to do with that test, you want to tell the patient to say, when, when they open their mouth, have them say, ah, 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 and see if the levator villi palatini muscle uh, fatigues, the one that's responsible for elevating your soft palate. And don't look at the uvula too much. The uvula can, uvula can, do, can do all sorts of things, okay? And then, like I mentioned, you see decreased deep tendon reflexes on one side, over the, one side of the body over the other, okay? Then we have pyramidal paresis. So I already mentioned this. You have this posture. Uh, of internally rotated shoulder, elevated um, uh, shoulder, and then externally rotated hip, okay? Um, muscle testing, so coming from this, uh, or, or talking about the hypotonicity, you're gonna have weak muscles on the side of the hypotonicity. Makes sense, because you have more, we have less alpha motor and gamma motor neuron activity. So let's say you have this pyramidal paresis, and we call this a soft pyramidal paresis lesion, is you have this increased flexure tone, and then when you go ahead and you muscle test, for example, the triceps, which is an extensor muscle, that might be weak because there it's hypotonic, okay? And you're gonna perform the same tests in the lower extremity, and you might see this pyramidal distribution. Next, you're gonna have increased sympathetics, okay? So the blood pressure might be different from one side to the other, uh, depending on the cortical activity and the PMRF function, okay? So let's say, let's stick to the right PMRF dysfunction. Let's say I have a right PMRF dysfunction, that means that I'm not inhibiting my IML, okay? So sympathetics go higher and my blood pressure elevates. And you might see a change from one side to the other, so that's why you always wanna take the blood pressure bilaterally, and you also wanna take it lying, uh, sitting, and standing. And in our advanced club, we'll talk about more of that and how the vestibular system plays a role in the autonomic nervous system as well. But another cool thing that you might want to consider uh, when we talk about the PMRF inhibiting the IML and its connections to um, the cardiac centers is that the right, the right PMRF, the right vagus, and the right cerebellum are connected to the right SA node, okay? The left PMRF is connected to the left AV node or the AV node. There's only one SA node and one AV node, okay? So right PMRF will be controlling or will be sending, in, uh, will be sending uh, activity or modulate the SA node and the left PMRF will activate the AV node, okay? So if you have a PMRF lesion on the right side, you might see things like tachycardia, meaning elevated heart rate. But if you see lesions in the left PMRF, you might see uh, things such as arrhythmia, because the SA node is primarily responsible for uh, generating heart rate, and the AV node is primarily uh, responsible for gener generating a rhythm of the heart, okay? So those are just some things you might wanna consider. And remember, those are not the only things that can cause arrhythmia or tachycardia, absolutely not. But if you have other PMRF findings, that could be something worth looking, looking into, okay? Heart rate, so obviously, if you have increased sympathetic globally, you're gonna have increase of heart rate. Uh, increased sweating, so if you have increased sympathetics, you're obviously gonna sweat to uh, get rid of heat. Um, and how you wanna test this, you're just gonna touch your patient's hands and you're gonna feel if they are uh, sweaty or they cold or they warm and, warm and sweaty, and what's the difference from one side to the other, okay? So let's say you're testing for, for their, or feeling their hands, 
and they're cold and clammy. More cold and clammy on the right side versus the left. You might think increased sympathetics on the right side, okay? If, let's say, they have cold hands bilaterally and there's no sweating at all, my thought process might go more into a metabolic, maybe a thyroid issue, okay? But sweating is usually associated with a sympathetic response, okay? Cold skin, okay? Same thing, we talked about that. Uh, slow capillary refill. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna uh, apply some pressure on the, at the fingertip like this, of the patient's fingertip, and you're gonna press for about three to five seconds, and then you're gonna look how fast the uh, finger will resume its original color, okay? How fast the blood will perfuse back into the tissue, okay? And usually, and you wanna compare it bilaterally, and normal response is that the, uh, the finger should or the skin should resume its original color uh, in about two to three seconds. If it takes more than three seconds, there's a lag, you might think about increased sympathetics on that side due to increased vasoconstriction. Okay, then we have decreased bowel sounds. So important thing to assess uh, from visceral diagnosis. So if you have absent bowel sounds you, and you're certain that there's no bowel sounds, that's an emergency. You need to uh, you need to call the ambulance. And at that case, in that case, um, if there's uh, let's say about one to five bowel sounds per minute, that's a really hypoactive function, and there's a high um, chance of increased sympathetic output. If there's about five to twenty-five sounds per minute, that's usually normal. Anything more than that, we're thinking of a little bit too much parasympathetic activity. Okay, then we have pupillary dilation. Well, we talked about pupillary dilation a lot last week, so you already know how to test for that. But looking at the resting tone of the pupils with increased sympathetics on one side or the other, you might see correctasia, meaning a greater or larger pupil on one side or the other, okay? So I have, let's say I have a PMRF dysfunction here on the right side, which is not inhibiting our uh, IML, increased sympathetics, larger pupil on the right side, and then you want to go ahead and shine a light into that pupil and see how it reacts. If you forgot how to do that, go back to last week and uh, kind of remind yourself how to do that. So then next one, abnormal VA ratio. We also talked about this last week. So we're looking at the veins to arteries ratio in the back of the eye. So you're going to take your ophthalmoscope and look at, look at the central uh, retinal artery branches and see if the veins and the arteries, the diameter is two to one or if it's increased. If it's increased, meaning that, let's say you have three to one or four to one ratio of veins to arteries, you have smaller diameter of the arteries, meaning you have more vasoconstriction, more sympathetic tone, okay? Then we look at respiration rate, important obviously. Week one, we talked about how important oxygen is. It's one of the most, uh, one of the most important things that your brain needs to survive. So if they're hyperventilating versus hypoventilating, it's really important to assess that and see if they, if they have appropriate rib cage mechanics. Okay, sexual function, you wanna ask about that, classically known as parasympathetic versus sympathetic uh, issues. Okay, then let's go ahead and talk about other ways to test the integrity of the brainstem. So we have our Valsalva, uh, maneuver. Commonly we know that in orthopedic uh, diagnosis as well, but it's also a neurologically important thing for us to check. So when you do the Valsalva maneuver, you are going to increase the intra-abdominal and thoracic pressure, which is going to increase the uh, peripheral, um, peripheral pressure on the vasculature and in, uh, or in the baroreceptors. Barrow and when you increase the activity in the baroreceptors, you are going to see a certain change in heart rate and blood pressure. But the one that I'm going to really talk about today is going to be the baroreceptor reflex uh, when we uh, test for the carotid sinus uh, reflex. So the baroreceptor reflex is a really important one for us to understand because if you understand how it works, you are going to understand how different dysautonomias work as well, such as POTS or vasovagal, vasovagal um, syncope. Okay? So with the baroreceptor reflex, what we do, just plain and simple, we apply pressure on the carotid sinus and the normal response is to have decrease in heart rate, okay? So I have a picture there. I'm gonna explain it to you, the pathway. So what's gonna happen? First of all, we have our aortic arch here and we have our common carotid artery and then we have our external carotid artery and then we have our internal carotid artery. 
And in the internal carotid artery at the very beginning, we have this carotid sinus. And the carotid sinus has these baroreceptors in it. And those baroreceptors are pressure receptors. You also have those receptors in the aortic arch, okay? So they, they are gonna fire in response to difference in blood volume and the pressure in the receptors, okay? So let's say you have increase in pressure in the, right, in the carotid sinus. What's gonna happen is that that information is gonna fire, is gonna fire through the um, cranial nerve nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve, nerve, go into the brain stem and activate nucleus tractus solitarius and the PMRF and the dorsal motor nucleus of cranial nerve 10, so the vagus, to decrease the heart rate and the blood pressure, okay, to allow vasodilation and decrease heart rate, okay? So that's the normal response when you get increase in the baroreceptors, okay? If you decrease the activity in the baroreceptor, what's gonna happen, you no longer have firing or the apron portion of the cranial nerve nine doesn't fire into the brainstem and we allow more sympathetic tone or we allow for the heart rate to uh, elevate, okay? So what we can do with this is we can, with our patients, what we're gonna do is you're gonna take your stethoscope and you're gonna auscultate for in their heart. You're gonna go into the herbs point and what you're gonna do is you're gonna place your stethoscope, stethoscope there and you're gonna listen while you apply pressure on the carotid sinus, like this, okay? You apply pressure there and we wanna do this on the right side. And you're gonna apply the pressure until you feel the pulse obliterate, okay? Once you feel that, you're gonna release off, of on, the, off on the pressure until the pulse comes back and you're gonna listen for the response of the heart. So like I said, the normal response is for the heart rate to decrease about five to 10 beats per minute, okay? And then it should fatigue and it should come back to normal, okay? You can also use a pulse ox with this, but I would recommend you use your stethoscope because you can actually, it's a faster way for you to listen. It's more accurate because uh, the pulse ox will have to calculate your, blood, blood, uh, your heart rate, etc. So it might be a little bit late um, checking your heart or, or responding to your heart rate change. Okay, so the abnormal reaction could be that the heart rate doesn't go down. This could be an issue in the PMRF. Yes, absolutely. So if the heart rate doesn't go down, we don't have PMRF activity to inhibit the IML, to inhibit the sympathetics, and to bias those inhibitory cardiac, cardiac outputs. Okay, or what if, when, what if we have too, too big of a response, so the heart rate, heart rate depresses too much, that's something that we call a vasovagal response, okay? So the PMRF already had too much activity in it, and now the heart rate depressed too much, okay? Then we also have the orthostatic challenge, and it's really similar. And what you're gonna do is same thing, you're gonna auscultate for the patient's heart, and you're gonna uh, have them go laying, laying and have them, go, have them lay down for, for a couple minutes, and then have them uh, come stand up. And as they stand up, you're listening to the heart rate and you're seeing how it changes, okay? And now you might be already able to explain what happens when a patient goes or a person goes from laying, lying down to standing up. So when you go from lying to standing, what happens is that all the blood will pull into your legs, okay? When that happens, um, you get less blood in your brain. Okay, and remember, we need field delivery. Our brain needs oxygen, it needs blood in order to survive and to function. So what we need to do is we need to have vasoconstriction to bring the blood into the brain because if, it, if, it, if that doesn't happen and we stand up, you're gonna get dizzy, you're gonna get possibly nauseous, you might faint, okay? And you might get hypoxic and ischemic, okay? So when you go standing, from laying, you go laying from, from laying to standing, what happens, you have decreased pressure in the internal and carotid, uh, in the carotid sinus, and therefore you're not activating the nucleus tractus solitarius and the PMRF to allow for the heart rate to come up, to push more blood into your brain, to have more vasoconstriction, okay? Or what ha in an abnormal reaction, what might happen is when you come stand up, when you go ahead and stand up is you have a increase in heart rate. Let's say you have over 30 beats per minute increase in heart rate and you feel like you're really unstable and you feel like you're gonna fall down, you, you might actually even faint. That's what we call POTS, 
postural tachy uh, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but that's, that's one abnormal response. Or if you go from lying to standing and now you have a decrease in the heart rate, this is a vasovagal syncope, meaning that we had too much output. This, this is often an uh, issue in the cerebellum. And we're going to talk about Purkinje cells, etc. I'm going to draw, you, draw out a pathway for you so this makes sense. But in a vasovagal response, you stand up and your blood pressure goes down. Okay, same thing might happen. You might feel dizzy. You might not feel stable. Okay, and these are important things to understand if you want to treat uh, certain forms of dysautonomia, such, such as POTS. Okay, so like I said, POTS is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and it's a form of dysautonomia associated with orthostatic intolerance. So you going from laying down to standing or sitting to standing, and and with an exaggerated tachycardic response. So we usually see an increase of 30 or more, more beats per minute within the first 10 minutes of you standing. Sometimes it happens immediately, sometimes it happens within the 10 minutes. And there's about one, one to three million Americans that suffer from it, and the majority of them are females. And since it's a syndrome, it has a cluster of symptoms associated with them. These are just some of the common ones, uh, such as lightheadedness, headache, extreme fatigue, and mental clouding, okay? So what is the mechanism behind this? Well, you already kind of know, but I'm going to draw you, uh, I'm going to draw for you a, a um, more central, central mechanism and showing you how this really works in the brain. And then we're going to talk about what we can do for these patients. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about the orthostatic challenge a little bit more and the central mechanism behind uh, vasovagal syncope and POTS. Okay, it's gonna make a lot more sense to us and we can understand how we're gonna treat this and what you might expect to see. Okay, so first let's talk about a scenario number one. So you go from lay, lying down to standing and you have excessive depression of heart rate. Okay, so there's too much output of the pontomedullary reticle formation to decrease the heart rate. Okay, and that's not supposed to happen. So let's draw out centrally what happens so first, we have our vestibular apparatus, right here. We have the otolith and we have the canals. We all know this by now. Then we have our brainstem. I'm going to make it real big. Okay. We have the midbrain, we have the pons, and then we have the medulla. Okay. Then we're going to have some certain tracts that are really important. So we have the NTS, we have the PMRF. We have the vestibular nucleus. I'm going to draw it here. But remember, it's in the pontomedullary junction. And then we're going to have the dorsal motor nucleus of cranial nerve 10 of vagus. Okay? So, what's going to happen is when you go from lying to standing, the vestibular apparatus will sense that there's a difference, different, uh, difference in uh, gravity sensation. And it's going to fire to all these different nuclei. So I just know that it's, oh, it's going to affect all these. And it's going to excite them. Okay, so it's going to excite the vestibular nuclei. It's going to excite the nucleus tractus solitarius, the PMRF, and the dorsal motor nucleus of cranial nerve 10. But at the same time, remember, we have a collateral going into the cerebellum. And now, if you remember from the cerebellar lecture, this is a little bit advanced, but it's okay. Because uh, you can re you can go back and you can rewatch these videos, but in the cerebellum, the structure or um, uh, it's the structure of the cerebellum is that we have these Purkinje cells in the cortex of the cerebellum. So we have cerebellar cortex, and then we have the deep cerebellar nuclei. So the Purkinje cells are inhibitory, and they're modulating these de deep cerebellar nuclei, which are the output of the cerebellum. But these uh, Purkinje cells. So I'm going to mark them PC, Purkinje cells, also modulate and fire and inhibit these nuclei here. Okay? Inhibition. So it's modulating all the time and it's picking up these errors or differences in, uh, in activity and it's making sure everything is running accordingly. Okay, so now you go from lying to standing you activation of all these nuclei in the brainstem and these areas 
and then at the same time the Purkinje cells come in to inhibit them so we don't get too much activity and at the same time remember the baroreceptors will get less activity to increase the heart rate but in vasovagal syncope what happens is that you lose the inhibition from these Purkinje cells and we have excessive output of these uh, nuclei such as the nucleus tractus solitarius and the PMRF and the dorsal motor nucleus of cranial nerve 10 which will uh, depress our heart rate excessively and we don't want that to happen okay so hope that makes sense to you now and the real question is what do we do about this okay so if you're gonna adjust this patient uh, you are gonna be activating let me get another color here you are gonna activate all these nuclei with an adjustment you're also going to activate the vestibular apparatus and the vestibular nuclei okay and you're also going to activate the cerebellum the Purkinje cells so you really don't have any bias towards what you're trying to towards what you're trying to rehabilitate rehabilitate okay so what we could possibly do is we can utilize different uh, therapies that are biasing more of the inhibitory pathways such as doing gaze stabilization and you remember from this our vestibular week uh, that the way you do gaze stabilization is you can do it passive or you can do it active uh, I would start with passive so what you're gonna do is you're gonna contact the patient's head and you're gonna move the head from side to side while they fixate their eyes on a target okay and you can do it vertically and you can do it horizontally okay so that gaze stabilization and having that fixation fixation is going to bias more of the Purkinje cell activity to inhibit these areas okay there are other therapies you can do as well but this is a really simple and easy one you can do and it's really powerful therapy okay so hopefully that makes sense more sense to you now let's draw out what happens in POTS All right, so now let's talk about POTS and the central mechanism behind that and how we can possibly treat it. And just to remember um, that there can be other mechanisms behind these uh, syndromes. So this is just a basic understanding of what's happening centrally and what ha what's happening in the uh, baroreceptors and how it's influencing our heart rate and our blood pressure, okay? So let's review a little bit the normal orthostatic response. So if I go from lying to standing, the normal response is for my heart rate to elevate a little bit to increase vasoconstriction and to pump more blood into my brain so I don't get hypoxic or ischemic. But in POTS, what happens is you have excessive elevation of the heart rate, okay? More than 30 beats per minute. And this can happen immediately or it can happen within 10 minutes of you standing up. And let's just review the central or talk about the central mechanism a little bit why that happens all right so like i mentioned we have our cerebellar cortex has Purkinje cells okay and what the Purkinje cells do they'll come and they'll inhibit the deep cerebellar nuclei okay there's a lot of a lot of these connections okay they'll come in and inhibit the deep cerebellar nuclei now remember we have four cerebellar nuclei we have the uh, fastigial, globose, and boliform, and the dentate nucleus. So fat guys eat donuts. Okay, that's our mnemonic for that. And the output of the cerebellum is through the de uh, deep cerebellar nuclei, and it's excitatory. And it is excitatory to one particular uh, area that we are interested in right now, which is the PMRF. Okay, excitatory connection. So this whole system is getting activated when you go from lying to standing also you're getting vestibular affrontation remember the vestibular system is going to send a collateral it's going to activate the uh, cerebellum and then you're going to have different responses here okay so the normal response is to activate the PMRF and the baroreceptor reflex is to increase the uh, heart rate and increase the blood pressure in order to um, um, uh, adjust for the change in gravity but in POTS, when you have this excessive heart rate, what happens is you either have an issue in the PMRF or you have an issue in the cerebellum, okay? So commonly what might happen is you lose this connection or there's a dysfunction 
from the deep cerebellar nuclei into the PMRF. So we're not getting activation off the PMRF. So now we're getting excessive heart rate. Heart rate goes up too much. So remember the PMRF is there to inhibit the sympathetics to decrease the heart rate. But now you lost the connection from here to there or you have an issue in the PMRF. And now when you go from lying to standing, boom, your heart rate elevates like crazy and you start feeling dizzy and you might not be able to stand. Okay, you might fall down. So these are serious conditions and I would look into them more, read more about research before actually starting to uh, uh, treat anyone because this autonomias can be really tricky to treat and I've only seen doctors uh, perform certain kind of things to their patients with this autonomias. And one of the things you can do for POTS is play with that or, or work on with that on a tilt table. Okay, so you put the patient laying down on a tilt table and you start elevating the tilt table gradually up and you're monitoring their heart rate while you're doing that. Immediately when the heart rate goes up too much, you want to stop the elevation and maybe go down one or two degrees. And then you wait for the heart rate to go down and then you elevate once again. And then you keep doing that same pattern until you have um, rehabilitated the system and it's working better, okay? And this might take time, okay? This is not something you might be able to be fixed in one session, okay? And while you're doing that tilt table, tilt table therapy, you might do other strategies and therapies such as gaze stabilization. So you might wanna put uh, certain objects into the ceiling and then you can work on the gaze stabilization while they're laying down, or you can ha have your finger in front of their face and have them do gaze stabilization there. There are other things you can do. You can work on pursuits, saccades, etc. Depending on what's your goal and what uh, what is the uh, appropriate therapy therapy for that patient. But do you understand these are these are pretty advanced um, uh, uh, concepts. If you don't understand it immediately, it's fine. Go back and watch the video again. But I hope you have a better understanding of what's a what is a vasovagal uh, response and what you might see in POTS and what is a normal response in, uh, in going from lying to standing or going from standing to lying in uh, relation to the baroreceptor reflex, okay? All right, so now let's talk about a couple case studies, trying to put everything together. So, we, so far we talked about lobes of the brain. We know to, how to assess for the function of the frontal lobes, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobes, the temporal lobes. Okay, we're pretty comfortable with that. We also looked at different eye movements. We had our six uh, major eye movements we talked about. We talked about the vestibular function. Okay, we talked about the cerebellum and we have talked about the autonomics. Okay, so at this point, I think it's a, it's a good time to kind of put everything together and look at different case studies. We're gonna have two different case studies. They're not too hard um, and these are real patient, patient uh, cases and hopefully it'll bring everything uh, together and make sense to you. So, case study number one, we're gonna have a 30-year-old patient presents with left shoulder and hip pain and anxiety. So how you wanna go through these is you wanna look at each symptom individually and you wanna create differentials. What could it be? Could it be that or could it not be that? And then you end up with one, uh, one possible diagnosis. So, Patient with left shoulder and hip pain, okay, there can be trauma, there can't be anything happen, anything happened to the left shoulder or hip. Uh, anxiety is often we, uh, I mean, there could be so many different things for anxiety, but one way to think about it and bring it back to what we've been talking about is if you have a decreased function of the frontal lobes, that can sometimes create anxiety or hyperactive mesencephalon sometimes can create these states as well. Okay, that's all we know so far is they have pain on the left side of the body on, the, on their shoulder and hip and, and they have anxiety. And obviously you wanna do your chiropractic exam as well, look at their posture and see if you find any, uh, find any uh, changes posturally and uh, then do your neurological exam as well. So what we found find uh, is that the patient has finger tap with three hesitations on the right. So if you, are, if you have hesitation, if you're doing finger tapping like this and you hesitate like this, that's usually associated with the contralateral frontal lobe. So remember you're testing for frontal lobes. So which frontal lobe are we talking about if they have a hesitation on the right side? We're talking about the left frontal lobe. Yes, you got it right. Point localization, okay? 
point localization is a test for bridal lobe. So they have decreased um, localization on the right side. So what possibly happened that a doctor were, was touching on their arm like this and asking the patient to touch exactly where they touch. You remember this from uh, week two. And it's decreased on the right side. So we may be thinking the map of the somatosensory cortex might not be that good at the moment and it's not picking up where you're touching uh, on the on the arm okay or in the hand then we have decreased right arm swing with gait okay possibly two things that we talked about that can cause a decreased arm arm swing that could be contralateral frontal lobe or the red nucleus contralaterally as well okay and then you want to do a dual task such as tell the patient to uh, come back from uh, by sevens from hundred and while, while they're walking, you're looking at if the arm swing gets better or it gets worse, okay? If they're relying more on those subcortical areas uh, more. Then we're looking at the blood pressure. And by the way, before we go to blood pressure, we already have a kind of an axis here, okay? We're talking about left cortex. We're talking about information coming here from the right side of the body to the left cortex. Then we're looking at blood pressure, okay? So the blood pressure is 138 over 90 on the left and then 120 over 80 on the right. So increased blood pressure on the left, what could be the cause? Well, what you know from today, it could be a PMR of dysfunction. And looking at these three prior findings, that means that uh, they're, they're showing us that we have less cortical activity or integrity, and therefore we have less firing to that left PMRF, and the left PMRF is not inhibiting the IML, and that could cause the high blood pressure on the left side. And remember, we also had pain in the shoulder and in the head on the left side. So the descending pain inhibition from that left PMRF could be obscured as well. Okay, next thing we have correctasia on the left. Correctasia was a larger pupil and here we can think about we have increased sympathetic tone on the left side and then what you want to do is you want to shine a light in there and see what is the pupil response. If you have a really slow response or slow fatigue, that's usually associated with increased sympathetics on that one side. So once again, a PMRF finding on the left side, not inhibiting the IML. Increased pinwheel on the left, so increased sensation. This is another one PMRF. Palatal, per palatal paresis on the left, another PMRF finding, okay? So I think the axis is pretty clear here what's happening with this patient, okay? They might need more affrontation coming from the right side of their body to activate the left cortex and to activate the uh, left PMRF and to uh, cause more descending pain inhibition to the left shoulder and hip and also create this, create the autonomic balance uh, from one side to the other, okay? So the main question is which side would you adjust? You would wanna adjust the right side, okay? And then you wanna recheck your findings if they got better. That's the most important thing. You always wanna post check. If your findings didn't get better, you're looking at a different uh, mechanism here, okay? Then you might have to uh, think about other strategies or other uh, possibilities, what's happening in this patient's nervous system, okay? So let's go case study number two. All right, so case study number two, we got a 50-year-old female and com who comes into your office with primary complaint of constipation. So when somebody has constipation, what's the first thing that comes into your mind that could be going wrong in their system? Uh, I think about uh, increased sympathetics, absolutely could be one. Uh, it could be other things too uh, associated with constipation, but in regards, and in, uh, in regards to our, our neuro exam, uh, that's what we're thinking about right now. Uh, and then upon inspection, both eyes are normally dilated. I think either high firing dilators or low firing constrictors. And the right pupil is slightly bigger than the left. Okay, so we have right correctasia. Okay, do we have really low firing constrictors here or high firing dilators? Once again, you want to look at the, look at the pupillary light reflex and see how it reacts. But bilateral uh, dilation. If you are associating that with sympathetics, that could mean that you have high firing dilators in there. Or you have decreased function in the heading or westphal nucleus. Bilateral in the midbrain, that's causing uh, less, amount, less parasympathetic 
pupillary constriction, but more likely we're talking about a sympathetic uh, response here. Okay, so then blood pressure on the right, we have 152 over 96, and on the left, we have 142 over 88, uh, 82. Okay, so increased sympathetics on the right side, looking at the right pupil and the blood pressure, that's kind of what we're going, uh, going with right now. Finger tap is burst on the left, so where's finger tap on the left? We associate that with the right cortex, the right frontal lobes. Okay, <clears throat> bilateral DDK, dystiodocokinesia. So this is our rapid alternating uh, movements. You can do it here, you can do them here, you can do the piano playing, and they have bilateral DDK, meaning that it's a positive, so possibly they had off-axis movement, or they were slow and sluggish, okay? And bilaterally, meaning that there's an issue in the in the cerebellum bilaterally. Maybe they're not getting enough affrontation. Maybe uh, maybe they're not really act not really an active person. They they're always home. They're they're working on their computer. They don't exercise, etc. And they're not getting enough muscle spindle and GTO affrontation. The cerebellum uh, is just not doing that well. Okay, finger to nose. We have slightly worse on the left. So testing a classic cerebellar test that we have often associated with dysmetria if there's a dysfunction in the cerebellum. So we have less cerebellum findings, right cortical findings, and right increased sympathetic so far. And we have a larger, larger blind spot on the left, okay? So remember, the temporal field or the upper field of vision and the lower field of vision are um, contrib uh, contributed from the contralateral brain. So the upper field of vision is associated with temporal lobe and the lower field of vision is associated with parietal lobe. And overall, they have a lar larger blind spot on the left, meaning that the, the, the frequency of firing of the right brain might be, uh, might be a little bit down, okay? It might not be doing that well. Then we have decreased left arm swing again, okay? What I think about is uh, right red nucleus or the right frontal lobe possibly, okay? So you, I think you got it. I think you got it pretty well. Which side would you adjust these uh, adjust this patient, or which side would you do your therapies? And remember, you you can do so much more than just adjusting. You can use all the receptor-based therapies out there. One thing uh, I can recommend, or you might want to try, is doing complex movements that we talked about. Now you can do this complex movement with your leg and with your arm at the same time, and you can do them passive or active. Okay. And you might want to try doing both, that's more stimulation, and see how it changes your results or your te uh, findings, okay? So in this case, we're talking about a, a higher sympathetic tone. Somehow we have to bring that uh, sympathetic uh, balance, uh, sympathetic tone down and balance the system bilaterally, okay? So for this patient, you might want to try to adjust them on the left side. You might want to do some therapies on the left side and you might want to maybe do some gaze stability exercises, the complex movements. Uh, you might want to try some uh, different smells on the right side. It's, it's endless. You can try and see if that changes your findings, okay? But this is kind of like how we go through uh, these patient cases, and these are really simple ones, okay? There are way more complex ones that are kind of all over the place, and you're gonna be like, oh, this, is, this didn't follow the axis at all, what do I do? Well, you're just gonna count on your neuro exam and you're gonna see what you find and you're gonna come up with the most appropriate therapy and then you're gonna do something and then you're gonna post check and see what you found. And in the advanced club, you're gonna dive a lot deeper into all of the clinical aspects of functional neurology. So hopefully we'll see you there in the future as well. But this is how we do it and uh, thank you for this week. I'll see you uh, I'll see you next week.